asked you in my opening to ask yourselves as you are listening to the testimony, what are we hearing about Edwin? So I want to focus the next 20 minutes or so on Edwin and what his day was like on November 9, 2015, and what his day was like on November 10, 2015. <coughs> 7 a.m. November 9, 2015, Edwin got up, like he does every day, and went to work at his job at the Public Works Department in Atlantic City. He works there as an electrician. He worked there all day long, and he clocked out at 2 p.m. that day, 2.30. You're going to see, we've agreed, and there's a stipulation as to his time cards from November 9th and November 10th. Gets done work, middle of the afternoon, takes a ride to his cousin Rosie's house in Galloway, where he helps fix a door or a ceiling fan. He leaves there, goes over to Joe Judge's house. Joe Judge lives in Egg Harbor City. Two of them were getting ready to go on a work trip the next day down to Florida. I heard Mr. Judge tell you yesterday that Edwin, in addition to his full-time job, had a side job where he helped Mr. Judge work on yachts and Edwin would do the electric <coughs> yacht. They had to gather the tools that they would need to go on this trip that they had planned for the next day. <coughs> Little after 5 p.m., Dennis calls. Dennis, who we know from the testimony and the text messages, is always asking for rides. His text messages are filled with him asking for rides from Pops or Allison or Courtney. Edwin leaves Joe's <coughs> house and goes to the McDonald's in Egg Rover City. Now, we know that Dennis had been at that McDonald's with Stephen Martinez also known as Benji. And we know that Dennis left that McDonald's at about 10 of 6 or so that night. Edwin goes over to the park by Farragut, and then we see Dennis and Edwin at the Walmart shopping. Edwin buys toothpaste, he buys Delsum cough syrup, he buys honey, and he buys tea, all items that his wife had asked him to pick up because their son had a bad cough. <coughs> After Walmart, Edwin goes back over to the park by Farragut again, He's there for about 15 or 20 minutes. He leaves, he takes Route 40 back towards the Walmart, through the parking lot towards the White Horse Pike. <coughs> back by his cousin Rosie's house. Not sure exactly what time he leaves there, but we know that Edwin had Rosie text Edwin's wife Deanna at 8.41 that Edwin was on his way home. We know that Edwin stopped in the FSEC and CVS. We saw him on the surveillance at 8.49 went in there looking for the iron-on patches for the jeans that he had that had holes in them and a special deodorant that he liked. He goes home, must plug in his phone because we know his phone gets powered back on at 9.02 p.m. And he's up most of the night that night with his wife getting ready for his Florida trip the next day. He communicates with Dennis. Between 2 and 3.30 a.m., Dennis texts him twice. Edwin texts Dennis about how Deanna went out, bought Wawa sandwiches, and was going to want to talk and eat. And we know at some point in the middle of the night, somebody in Edwin's house makes a McDonald's run because we saw the Atlantic City McDonald's receipt from 3 a.m. that the police recovered from his van. And Edwin calls Dennis a few times.
times throughout the course of that night. The next day, November 10th, 2015, Edwin does what he always does. He gets up, goes to work. Now, Dennis had port that morning. <coughs> and we know that Dennis was looking for a ride. We heard him ask Courtney on the phone call to come pick him up and take him to court. And we know that Dennis also that morning <coughs> texted Allison and Pops looking for a ride. He called and texted Edwin too. Call me. But Edwin was at work <coughs> because that's what Edwin does. He works. We know Edwin was having phone issues at some point in time, around noon, he borrows Maria Flowers' phone to call Dennis back. Early afternoon of November 10, 2015, while Edwin's at work, he receives word that he's needed over at the police station. Edwin goes over there, answers questions posed to him by Detective Cruz and Detective Scopa about what he had done the night before. Detective Cruz said to him, look, we don't want to get you jammed up. Edwin answers their questions. He's not arrested. He offers to let them look in his van. They let him go. A little later on that day, Joe Judge picks him up at work, takes Edwin home to pick up his bags. Mr. Judge's mother drives them to the airport, and they take a prepaid flight down to Florida, paid for by Mr. Judge's client. Mr. Judge told you yesterday Edwin seemed normal. Edwin spends the next five or six days down in Stewart, Florida, working alongside Joe Judge, and comes back home. Now, in the meantime, Edwin's van is searched and released back to his family. A month or so later, Edwin does another side job with Joe Judge, goes back down to Florida, this time 11 or 12 days. Drove down, flew back. January 12, 2016, <coughs> two months after the shooting of Michael Black, Lieutenant Fine and Detective Cruz want to get more information on Dennis. Remember, Dennis had been arrested November 10, 2015, the day after the murder. So, Fine and Cruz show up unexpectedly at the one place they know they'll find Edwin, work and surreptitiously report him. They tell him, wrapped up our investigation, we don't think you're involved. And once again, Edwin answers their questions. At the end of that conversation, Lieutenant Finan asks what he's doing that night. And Edwin says, oh, I got a side job. That's what Edwin does. He works, full time, part time, for his wife, his children. Lieutenant Finan, Detective Cruz leave. Again, Edwin is not arrested. Over two more months go by. Now, four months have passed since the murder. And Edwin is charged on March 21st, 2016. The state alleges Edwin conspired with Dennis to murder Michael Black, and that Edwin aided or agreed to aid or attempted to aid Dennis in both the planning and the commission of the knowing and purposeful murder of Michael Black. Additionally, they allege that Edwin possessed a firearm during the commission of this offense. 
said it in my opening, and I'm going to say it again. Edwin Velasquez is innocent of these charges. What evidence is the state going to point to that even comes close to proving that Edwin is guilty of these charges? Talk about Kayla O'Brien. We know that Kayla went to the Walmart with her mom around 7. She doesn't remember the exact time she came home, somewhere between 7 and 7.30. Walmart's about 10 minutes from her house. It was November. It was dark. She left her lights on. She goes back outside. She's about to get in the car when she describes seeing a loud gold van. The van went down Elmer's, turned around at Perry, <coughs> went back, parked at Campbellwood, Campbellwood. Now, she testified that she believed that vehicle had two individuals in it. She had no idea what their race was. She had no idea what they were wearing. She had no idea if anyone else was in the van. She never made eye contact with anyone in the van. She didn't hear any arguing. She didn't hear a gunshot. She didn't see any flashlights, which we know Michael Black's child saw. And she didn't see either individual walk past her house, let alone walk down towards Michael Black's house. Regarding this gold van, doesn't have a naked model, doesn't have a license tag, doesn't have any other identifying characteristics. No description of a broken taillight, nothing. There has been no positive identification that that van that she saw was Edwin's van or that either of the individuals she saw were Edwin. I mean, the police reports say silver. Where did that come from? Kayla never, ever, ever said she saw a silver van. No one did. And Kayla never said she was able to identify the race of the individuals. No lineup was done in this case. And a lineup is a common investigative tool. Lieutenant Klein <coughs> talked to you about it yesterday, something that many of us are familiar with. <coughs> I asked Lieutenant Klein, why didn't you do a lineup in this case? And he testified, because the witness said, couldn't identify them. Not only that, but Kayla was never shown a picture of Edwin's van. The sound of Edwin's van was never played for Kayla. Why not? Asked Lieutenant Finan. That it would be too prejudicial. Gee, I, I don't know, but basing an arrest off of a supposed identification I would suggest, and in a homicide, I would suggest that you would want to be sure and that that is something that should have been done. So at the end of the day, we do not have any identification of Edwin's van or that Edwin's van was on that street or that Edwin was in that van. While we're talking about the van, there was absolutely no physical evidence recovered from Ed Edwin's van that would establish that he had anything to do with this murder. No fingerprints, no blood, no hair, no fibers, no gun, no bullets, no shell casings, no gunpowder residue, no DNA, no flashlight, no evidence. What did they take out of Edwin's van? They took a leaf that sat in evidence for three and a half years, and they took a McDonald's receipt from 3 a.m. on November 10th, the next morning. Within two days, that van was released back to Edwin's family while he's still down in Florida at his second job. If law enforcement really believed that Edwin 
Ben's van was used to commit this murder, do you think that they would have given it back to him? They would not have. Now, let's talk next about text messages and calls between Edwin and Dennis. And I'm sure that Mr. McKelvey, on behalf of the state, is going to argue to you is evidence of some sort of conspiracy or agreement between them. Before the time of the shooting, there were two calls from Dennis to Edwin and two calls from Edwin to Dennis. Those calls were all between 5.08 and 5.41 p.m., all less than a minute or two. We know that during that time frame, Dennis <coughs> was at the Egg Harbor City McDonald's with Stephen Martinez, Benji. What's the more reasonable inference as to the nature of those calls between Edwin and Dennis at that time? Is it more reasonable that it was Dennis saying, I need a ride, can you come pick me up, I'm at the McDonald's? Those calls are not consistent with two men planning a murder. Let's look at the communications after the time of the shooting. Between 2 a.m. and 3.30 a.m., Dennis texts Edwin twice, and Edwin texts Dennis again about how his wife, Deanna, had gone out and gotten Wawa sandwiches and was going to want to talk and eat. <coughs> and Edwin does call Dennis several times. The key here is take a look at Dennis's text messages and calls to other people during that same time frame. Look at how many people he's texting in addition to Edwin during that time frame. There are a lot. The next morning, there are several texts from Dennis asking Edwin to call him. Now we know Dennis had court that morning. And we know Dennis was looking for a ride to court that morning. How do we know that? Well, we heard him on the phone with Courtney begging her to come pick him up. And there were text messages between Dennis and this guy Pops that he got rides from, as well as Dennis and Allison. He was looking for a ride from Edwin, too. But where was Edwin? Edwin was at work, because that's where Edwin always is. There is not one single text <coughs> message between Dennis and Edwin at any point in time, planning a murder or covering it up. Let's turn to this voicemail that Edwin left on Dennis's phone. We know Edwin was having difficulties with his phone. Again, at one point in time, around noon on the 10th, he borrows Maria Flowers' phone to call Dennis back. And Edwin knew Dennis had court that day. The state wants you to think that this is some sort of secret phone or secret phone number. The state's exhibit had it listed as an unknown subscriber, yet they never even subpoenaed that phone number. They never even realized that that phone number came back to a contact on Edwin's phone, Maria Flowers. And they never even attempted to find out who Maria Flowers was or to interview her. There is not one saved voicemail in which Edwin is talking to Dennis about planning a murder or covering up a murder. Let's turn to the jail calls. The state played seven <coughs> calls that were placed by Dennis to three separate people, Courtney, 
Dennis's father, and Stephen Martinez, Benji. And I have no doubt that the state's going to point to several times in those calls where Dennis says to tell Edwin they know nothing about a weapon, they're playing a bluff game. What about the fact that Dennis also tells Courtney to call Stephen? And she says Stephen's already called her. What about the fact that Dennis tells his dad that he was with a few people that night? And he was with a few people that night. We know that. We know he was with Stephen Martinez, Benji, because we saw them together on the surveillance. We know that Dennis went to Courtney's earlier in the afternoon around 3 when Edwin was out running errands, doing a, an odd job for Rosie, going over to Joe Judge's house to get ready for that Florida trip the next day. Dennis wasn't with Edwin then. What about the fact that Dennis calls Stephen Martinez, Benji, from the jail? He doesn't call Edwin. Edwin's not in custody at that point in time. He could have called him. He didn't. There is not one recorded jail call that establishes that Edwin and Dennis planned a murder or covered it up. Edwin never even visited Dennis in jail the whole time he was there. 